Hi, everybody. Good morning. This is Batya Blumenthal. I'm the branch supervisor of the Putterham Library. Um, we're going to admit everybody as we are admitting everybody. Hi, everybody. This is Batya Blumenthal, branch supervisor of the Putterham Library. Uh, happy to bring forth another session of gentle chair yoga with Keith Beasley. Um, today, uh, uh, today, as always, we wanted to thank our friends of the Brookline Library for sponsoring this program and programs like it. Uh, we also want to re recognize our community partners, Brookline Interactive Group, um, who uh, who uh, stream this program to their YouTube page, their Facebook page, as well as to uh, RCN and Xfinity Local Channel 3. Um, as always, uh, participation in this online yoga program could result in injury. Not all exercises presented here are suitable for everyone. These exercises are not intended to substitute for proper medical care or advice. Always consult your physician before beginning any exercise program. The creators, teachers, and producers assume no responsibility for injuries from participation in this program. And without further ado, here's Keith. Hi, good morning. Let's start in uh, mountain pose. Remember you have your choice here. You can be seated like I am right now. Or if your balance is good and you'd like to stand, you can also stand like I am right now. Notice that the general shape of the pose is similar, or at least the alignment of the pose is similar. There's a straightness, an extension of the spine up, whether I'm standing like that or I'm seated. So you get a choice here. It's always nice to have choices. And we want to have the feet so they feel like they're supporting us. So for me, it tends to be about hip width, maybe slightly wider. Everybody's different, so experiment. Find out what feels the best for you. And if you're seated, try sliding towards the front of the chair and see how that feels. I'm going to turn sideways so you can see. And notice that my, my sitting bones, which are right underneath here, I can actually feel them as I rock back and forth like this. If you're standing, feel the bottoms of your feet. Feel the soles of the feet connecting with the earth. And actually, you'll feel that if you are seated as well. So if you're seated, you have the sitting bones and the feet. If you're standing, you just have the feet. And then we're extending up as we inhale. We're using the breath as like our friend. The breath is going to help us in our practice. And really, yoga is about, um, I mean, in many ways, it's so much about the breath. And all the other stuff that we do supports the way to improve our breath. So the opening of the heart and the chest and the expansion of the belly and the ribs, when we open these areas, our lungs are able to fill more easily. And the action of the breath is what influences our nervous system. So when we have a nice, easy, but comfortable breath and fulfilling breath, so we're getting enough, we're feeling like we're getting good air, it makes us calmer. It lets us calm down. So let's practice that. So we're going to uh, extend the spine up, gently press the feet down into the floor. So we feel supported, and then extending up through the spine, the back of the neck lengthens. So think about, think about this part of the neck lengthening so that don't let the chin lift up. You'll notice when I lift the chin, I get a big, I get a bend here. I don't, I don't want to be like this either. I want to be in between so that my face is really straight ahead. My face is a perpendicular to the floor, ideally. 
and then we'll take a few breaths like this. So we'll inhale and we extend the spine, lengthen the spine, perhaps by lifting the front ribs here. So if you think about it, your front ribs, if you, if you uh, palpate it down the ribs, you'll find where they end. They're gonna lift up there. You could even take your fingertips and gently lift the front of your ribs up. So this is more of a, not actually physically forcing anything, but I'm, I'm just sort of nudging them up with my fingertips to get that feeling of lifting and extension. And it's a small movement, perhaps just a half an inch. So it might not be something that you see, but we begin to feel the lifting. We call these micro movements, micro adjustments. And then as I exhale, I'm going to be softening the sides of the neck, the back of the neck, the shoulders, almost like a, there's a, a warm wash coming down and relaxing, even coming down the arms and the hands and the fingers. I'm going to go back and forth like that, inhaling, rising up, exhaling, floating down. Even the ribs are floating down as you exhale. The spine is still long as I exhale. And notice I'm not, I'm not suggesting when you breathe. So you follow, please follow these instructions and breathe at your own pace. So our timing may not always be exact. You'll have to adjust your uh, take the words that I use and overlap them with the uh, whatever it is you're doing. So if we're inhaling and extending the spine, you could repeat those words to yourself as you inhale. Inhale, extend the spine. Let this feel the spine rising up and then exhaling, feel a softening. The spine is still long and so the center part is still rising up even as the rest of the body kind of hangs down. You could let the arms drape down if you want it as well. You might notice a little dinging. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my phone just to remind me uh, to try to keep us on time. So hopefully it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's on pretty soft. So you may or may not be able to hear it. And I like to close my eyes for this, but you may want to keep your eyes open if you're standing. And we'll bring our palms together right in front of the heart. And we're going to add our sun breath. So we're going to inhale, and the hands are going to float up. And then they turn, and the palms float down. And then they come across, they meet right in the middle, right in front of the navel, and then the next time we inhale, they float up. So the hands follow the breath. The hands follow the breath. Uh, you can even add a little sigh if you want. Uh, so sighing is the, a natural way that we release tension. And so you could do also do this standing if you preferred. Suggestion is that once you settle into one or the other, either standing or seated, unless you have a reason to move, a good reason, stay with that for this practice. You can always change it the next time. So there's that nice lifting up feeling. The arms are giving us that extra lift of the heart and the chest, that opening, and then we'll bring the palms back together. We're going to go the other way now. We'll exhale, release the hands down. They look kind of like floating down, like as if there was water there. And then we'll turn the palms up and let them come all the way up and then floating all the way down. The palms are touching. The fingers are touching. The fingertips are touching as they come down. Ah, 
You can add the sigh again if you want. <sighs> and if you know Ujjayi breathing, you're always welcome to add that. We won't, uh, we won't teach that today, but um, another time we'll try Ujjayi breathing. We call it the ocean sound in yoga. It's, it's a constriction in the back of the throat slightly, so you make sort of a, almost a, um, some people may say, say it sounds like Darth Vader uh, from Star Wars. You know, when he's breathing, he sounds like he's sort of mechanic. I mean, I think he is mechanically breathing. And then we're going to rest the hands, and let's roll the shoulders a few times, and then back the other way. And then one shoulder, and then the other. You're just loosening up the shoulders, loosening up the shoulders, keeping the face relaxed here. And you can go as fast or as slow as you wanted here. Don't go too fast and probably don't go too slow. But you could always speed up a little. We use the speed of our breathing and our movement to stimulate or to calm the energy. So if you're feeling like you need a little stimulation, it's pretty cold out today. Here, I think it's still about 10 degrees out. So uh, if you need a little stimulation, a little warmth, you can move a little faster. If you're feeling like it's warm enough, you're energized enough, you had enough coffee or whatever it is that gets you going in the morning, you could calm yourself by slowing things down a little bit. Your choice. Let's make the sound of OM together. So we'll do this for about 30 seconds. <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, I'll tap the bowl. We'll start and we'll make, if we were together, we'd be having a sea of OMs where we hear everyone, not at the same, we, everybody wouldn't start and end at the same time, but it would sort of be like this ocean. Each of us would be a little wave on the ocean and all the waves, of course, they're not always in sync. But imagine perhaps that there's other people and they're making the sound of OM around you. And uh, it's nice to close the eyes for this. You may want to sit down for this if you're standing. And we'll, uh, we'll make the sound of OM for about 30 seconds. Remember, it's the AH, big wide mouth. O shape of the lips is O. And finally, we close. Mm, and really feel the vibrations in the throat and perhaps even in the upper chest and the sternum. Sometimes they even go up, sometimes they tickle the inside of my ears. So uh, the vibrations are traveling all in this area right here. And remember not to overdo, less is more with our only. So let's breathe in together. A casual, nice, easy breath. Um, relaxing the shoulders down and continue on your own, breathing in and om. Um, sitting up nice and tall. and the eyes. Um, softening the jaw and the tongue and the throat. Last one. and listen to the silence for a moment. Whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. So they say that uh, <clears throat> singing is really good for us, and oming is really like singing. I mean, it is singing. 
the notes are maybe not conventional. It's not conventional song, but definitely like singing. <clears throat> and it activates various uh, um, neurotransmitters in the body, increases those. And sometimes it makes us feel good. There's actually, you can look online, there's been a lot of study of music and how it makes us feel. So to encourage everybody to own regularly, you could even do it more than once a day. You can do it a couple times a day, whenever you feel like it, or singing. So sitting up nice and tall, we're gonna lean from side to side. And you could do this, uh, again, if you want, if you felt like you needed to stand, you're welcome to stand. And we're shifting the weight here, shifting the weight, feeling it moving from the left to the right side. As I shift the weight, I'm feeling it in my foot, and the other foot is lifting up slightly. And if I'm seated, I'm also feeling it in the sitting bone beneath me on the chair. And I can start to slow it down a little bit. So I'm not using, so the more I slow down, the um, more challenging it becomes. There's no momentum now. If I'm moving slowly, there's no momentum. So this is definitely easier to move a little faster. So kind of, you have to decide, do I want to work a little harder, get the belly working a little harder, get the, the quadriceps working a little harder? Or do I want to feel a little bit more freedom? So one of the things we'll talk about sometimes in yoga is intention. And actually, it even goes for the rest of our lives. Any aspect of our life, intention often uh, influences how we feel about the experience. So you could, if you wanted, Think about what your intention might be today in your yoga class. You want to feel like you're, you're moving more freely. Everything's sort of move more fluid. You want to feel like you're uh, engaging the muscles to build strength. You want to feel like you're more balanced. Perhaps when you lean to the side like this, you pause for a moment and feel the balance there. You got to work on the balance to keep yourself balanced. And if you put your arms out like this, it feels different than if your arms are in like this. So you can try these different things. I would try one for each class, but you could vary it from class to class and see what happens. You see how it makes you feel, how, how you experience the class will be a little bit different. And maybe how you come away from the class at the end is a little bit different. So yoga is really a big experiment. Let's sit, sit up nice and tall and do a few cactus breaths like this, sweeping the arms open. Really, the, we're, the arms opening is facilitating the chest opening and the heart opening, this broadening across the collarbones and across from the sternum out to the armpits, keeping the belly, keeping the belly firm here. Don't let the belly, sometimes the belly wants to stick out. We get a big wide curve in the lower back and we want our curves in the back, but not giant curves. We want the curves to be, be um, well, natural curves. So there's a little curve here in, there's a little curve here out, and there's a little curve in the, in the cervical spine up here in. So we don't want to be like this. We don't want to be like this with too much curve. And we don't want to be the, the thoracic spine sticking way out like this. Or we'd, we'd like it to be natural. And we all have our, uh, we're all different. We all have our sort of ways that we, our body is, and we can work on suppleness in the spine. So we're going to do that. This is a little bit of a warm up. We've done it before. It's bending the spine in six ways. So suppleness in the spine, especially in the winter when it's cold and everything's dry out. Oh, I meant to mention at the beginning, water. You know, even just to have a little sip of water is a good thing during the class. 
especially if you're if you're in a place where the air is dry and for many of us um, in winter time the humidity is very low because it's so cold out so sitting up nice and tall resting the hands on the knees like this and take a couple of breaths so from the side it looks like this notice the arms are straight although the, the elbows aren't really locked they're straight, but they're not, uh, my arms are not locked. There's not really a lot of tension in the arms here. There's a firmness, but no tension. And then I'm going to inhale and lift my heart forward. So see if you can get the heart to move. Notice that my chin isn't moving so much. And even down here, my hips are moving a little, but not too much. I'm thinking about moving my thoracic spine forward and back. In the beginning, and that means uh, not just today, but if you practice this regularly, in the beginning, it takes a while to get the thoracic spine to move with some ease. We need to teach it some suppleness, and we do that with just small movements at first. So if you're new to this practice, think about just moving it a, a tiny amount, that micro movement forward and micro movement back. You could even, if you wanted to be able to feel it better, you could have one hand like this with the arm straight, and then you could rest the other one on the chest so that you could feel this lifting forward and then slight movement back. If you practice this regularly, over time, over uh, probably weeks, that you get more freedom. The spine becomes a little more supple. And that's really what yoga is about, really suppleness in the spine and being able to, because uh, remember the spine contains the nervous system or the heart of the nervous system, the spinal cord. And it, uh, when the spinal cord is uh, un, unfettered in the, in the uh, when the uh, spinal cord can move more easily, because it does move, the vertebrae moving the spinal cords in the middle, it does have to move a little bit when the vertebrae move. So that improves the signaling going to the, uh, going to the nerves. And oh, so we're rocking forward and back like this. You might notice as you become more supple, if you've been doing this practice, or if your thoracic spine is just more supple, that you get a little bit of movement with the chin and the pelvis. And I'm not forcing anything. I'm letting the heart move forward and back and letting the chin rise and fall with ease. But I'm not really trying to move the chin or the pelvis. And the arms are staying straight here. So the shoulders really stay in the same position and the heart is moving forward and back between the shoulders. And then come back just to a comfortable seated position. Let's do a couple of uh, cactus breaths here. Inhale and exhale to continue our warm up. See if you get a little bit more Maybe a little more ease with your cactus breath like this. You can vary the height of the hands. You could even uh, move the hands up and down. So the movement here is the same, but the position of the hands is slightly different. You can even sort of make a snake shape with the hands going back and forth, up and down. Elbows no higher than the shoulders. Elbows no higher than the shoulders. And then we'll bring the hands down. And the next one we're going to do is, uh, so that was bending the spine in six ways. That was one and two. That's the flexion and extension of the spine forward and, forward and back like this. So we're going to go side to side. I'm just going to start by rocking from side to side a little bit. But this time, keep the uh, sitting bones down in the chair. So I'm, the weight is shifting slightly, but I'm keeping the opposite sitting bone that would normally lift up. We'd normally let it lift up like this. 
keep it glued down to the chair. It might feel a little bit, uh, one side may feel heavier, but don't let the other side lift up. And we're going to start to get a little bit of bending to the side. Notice that the bending is, I'm lengthening, and there's a slight bending with this movement, slight bending. And bring the hands up like this. Now reach up and do the same thing below, keeping, there's a slight uh, leaning, but both sitting bones are still stuck down to the chair. And I'm emphasizing the reaching up, the opening here, so this, when I do this, this whole area uh, broadens, lengthens these ribs, the armpit broadens, and I'm not holding it. I was just, uh, so keep moving, keep moving like this. If you, if you have trouble feeling the opening here, slow it down a little bit. Slow it down so you can feel the ribs broadening. So this is building space between the, in, uh, with the intercostal muscles that separate the ribs. And then you could add a little bit more bending if you wanted, but keep the sitting bone on the opposite side uh, in the chair. Don't let it lift up. You're reaching up, and if your shoulders bother you, remember you can lift, try just lifting the elbows up like this. You could also work like this with the hands on the shoulders. So it's important not to create tension by over, uh, overreaching with the arms. We do our best to accept the limitations that we have, and then we find a way to adapt. There's, al there's always a workaround with something. There's always another way to do it. You just have to uh, think about it a little. And if you have trouble with that, you can always email me and I'll, I'll try to answer. Uh, I'll try to answer. I'll try to give you a workaround if you have something that you're struggling with. So sitting up nice and tall. And now bring the hands back to the shoulders and go ahead and move the elbows. So this is, uh, this is turning. So this is the spinal movement number five and six. And we're using the elbows as a guide. So as the elbows move back, we're really facilitating this, uh, this gentle twisting or turning in the belly. And you might even be able to feel. So again, if you, you wanted to, you could rest one hand on the belly and put one elbow like this. And you could even sweep the elbow back and forth, just on one side thinking about moving it back, and then moving the elbow forward. It's important to sort of let the body turn with the elbow. So I'm not moving the elbow in relation to the torso. It's really staying in about the same position. The tor it's almost like these, got, they, these are connected here, so they're, uh, they're moving together. They're moving together. feeling the movement down in the belly. And also maybe feeling a little bit of movement in the sitting bones underneath you. Or if you're standing, you'd feel it all the way down in the feet. And then coming back and then rolling the shoulders. So that's bending the spine in six ways. If you can, try to practice it a little bit every day, even just a minute or two. And think about ease and suppleness. That, so the idea is not forcing. The idea is to, is to uh, almost like invite the spine to move, invite these movements. You could even pick that as, a, uh, as an intention for your practice. In, think about inviting what we're doing instead of pushing it or forcing it and see how that changes the practice. There's all kinds of things we can do for intention. And sitting up nice and tall, let's take a couple of cactus breaths again. This time we're going to add a little hugging if you want. So you can start just by hugging around the elbows and the, and the uh, triceps. 
And if you want, you can move up to the shoulders if that's workable for you. Think about crossing the arms, uh, opposite arm on top each time. And you may be able to touch the fingers on the shoulder blades behind you. And it doesn't really matter whether you can. The nice thing about doing this, even though it would be nice to be together, uh, there's no competition here. There's nobody else to look at. It's just, so it's a competition with ourselves, I guess. So perhaps think about it that way. And one more time. And then bring the hands down and let's roll the shoulders. We'll do a little more release in the shoulders with our swimming. Allowing, so we were doing the elbows before like this. Think about letting the elbow move back and letting the torso turn as you move the elbow back. You can adjust the height of the arms and the elbows to make sure the shoulders feel okay. You could even work with the hands on the shoulders like this too. So if one way doesn't feel like it's what you want, try something different. Remember, no, there's no pain. We shouldn't be having any pain or discomfort when we do these movements. If we do, we need to, uh, make them smaller, um, uh, not try so hard, or don't do the movement altogether. So if you're finding that you do the movement and it causes pain, especially sharp pains, sometimes we'll wake up and there'll be like a pain somewhere. And uh, it, rather than trying to work on it, you might want to gently get some movement in that area, but uh, forcing it so that the, so we continue to have those pains is, in my experience, is always counterproductive. It doesn't go away and uh, it just makes it worse. So better to ease into things. The same thing with our, with our practice here. So now we're going to, we're going to do a little swimming forward. Again, working on the belly. So reaching out and across. So I reach out first, then I'm crossing over and coming down the outside of the leg and letting the movement happen in the torso, just turning in the torso. So good for our digestion and elimination. Two things that are very important. You know, they know now that for our immune system, is that uh, digestion and elimination are a key part of our immune system. We didn't used to know that. <laughs> so it's really fascinating some of the stuff that we now know. And sitting up nice and tall, and we're going to lift the chin up and down. Try not to drop the head backwards. Chin flicking up and down. So there's a slight, a slight uh, release back. And you can go ahead and relax the chin all the way down in the front. There, no forcing either direction. This is an easy movement. And if you do this movement regularly, uh, you'll get more range of motion over time. It takes, uh, takes patience. And sitting up nice and tall, relaxing the ear down. So just releasing the head, letting the weight of the head do the work here. You can add your pillow if you want for support. You could even bend a little bit with the body, let the body lean a little bit. If that, you could try that, see how that feels. Or you can keep the body, you can keep the spine almost straight and only let the neck move for your choice.
no pain or discomfort in these movements, especially the neck. People have a lot of trouble with their necks. So we have to be extra, extra nice to our neck, to the vertebrae in our neck. They're also the smallest vertebra. And then we're going to gently turn. Actually, let's try it like this today. We're going to sweep the arm. Um, let's start with the hands in front like this. I'm going to sweep the arm like this and then sweep the other arm like this. So the, the movement of the head is following the hand. We're letting the hand kind of lead us, almost like this idea where we're uh, opening. And you can vary the speed here. You can make it a little slower. can be more potentially more meditative that way. And if you go a little faster, it becomes a little more, a little more athletic, a little more like a dance. So, or you could pick something in between. So see what you're feeling like, like dancing, or you're looking for a little more meditative, a little more mental focus just on feeling the movement. And then go ahead and bring the hands down. We're going to circle. I should circle with one hand. Just take one hand and go ahead and circle. Again, I'm following my hand with my, uh, with my gaze. Or you could also close the eyes and then find that mental connection between the hand and the face and the eyes and follow the hand with the eyes, with the eyes closed. So using our proprioception to keep them in sync. And then we're going to switch hands. We're going to go the opposite way. Sometimes it's nice that we can close the eyes to give them a rest. It can also be a little more challenging Definitely feels different. You know, using using proprioception, we have a different experience. We use our eyes a lot. We use our eyes almost constantly, unless we're sleeping or we're. Uh, I'm trying to think. Of only well, when we shut our eyes, I mean, maybe we take a nap, but we seldom, unless you're a regular meditator and you close your eyes. Your eyes are always looking at something. So if we give them a chance to rest, we're experiencing a different, we're having a different experience, different sensory experience, especially. So if you're not, if you haven't been using the back of the chair, now might be a good time to slide back or if you're standing. Remember, we want to have support. We want to make sure that we have the natural curves in the spine, even with the back of the chair. So make sure your chair is either straight enough in the back, and you can always use it, a cushion for your lumbar if you need that. We do not want a rounded back. It's also good to have a seat that is relatively flat. We'd like to not have our butt sitting back in the seat, kind of like um, uh, in in our cars, many of the cars, the seat the, is, uh, this is the front of the seat over here, the back of the seat slopes down, hard to extend the spine up, uh, or in, impossible to really extend the spine up with any ease in that uh, configuration for the seat. But they do that to get more headroom. So especially if you're a tall person, uh, you may have gotten a car with enough headroom they drop the back of the seat. So we'd like it to be flat so that it's easier to sit and feel the extension of the spine. And then we're going to, uh, we're going to start, uh, rock. actually, let's do the toes and feet. We did this, I'm trying to think if we did it the last time, but 
I'm going to wake up the toes and the, and the uh, toes and the fingers here. So start with the toes and lift them up. Notice how my feet are flat on the floor. So I'm lifting my toes up by using the contracting the tops of the feet here. And but the rest of my feet are fairly relaxed. They're just sort of sitting there on the floor. So even if your toes just lift a tiny amount, just a little bit like this, like my fingers are doing, that's okay. We want to get them so that the rest of the foot can stay relaxed, and then we can begin to lift them a little higher. And that might take some practice, more than just one session. And then try the fingers too. Fingers are a little easier. And see if you can do, get them to do the same. So I'm extending and then flexing. Extend and flex. And so vary the pace here depending on what you're looking for. More meditative, we'll go a little slower perhaps even closing the eyes and feeling. See if you can even feel a connection between the each finger. So each finger has an, a, um, a related toe, thumb with the, big, with the big toe, index finger, et cetera. So see if you can feel the connection so that each one has its uh, counterpart down on the foot. So that when you lift up, you're feeling the fingertips and you're feeling the tips of the toes lifted too, and there's a connection. And you might not feel them all, you might not feel them individually, but you can even feel the, say, the fingertips as a group and the toe tips as a group as you lift them up. So we're trying to make connections here, connections between up here and the, and the rest of the body. We call that uh, we, uh, neuroplasticity. So we know now they used to think that we were not neuroplastic. In other words, we um, were unable, you know, nerves would die off and uh, they never regenerated. That's not true. They know now that the, uh, we can develop all kinds of new neural pathways with practice. It takes practice. That's the, that's the hard part, is the practice. And then we're going to rock the feet. So as I rock my feet, I'm feeling the bottoms of the feet, feeling un the underside. So I'm going from the balls of the feet all the way to the heels. Balls of the feet to the heels. Keep the feet pointed straight ahead, or keep the number 11. So if you looked at the feet, there's, they would form the number 11, a one and a one. And then we can add the wrists as well. So we were doing the fingers and toes before, now we're doing the wrists and the ankles. So see if you can feel a connection between the wrist, wrist, and right, and bring that connection down here with the ankle. So start by just, you can even look at them first, and then try closing the eyes and see if you can feel them moving at the same time. Try to get them to move at the same time. And then see if you can feel a connection between them as they're moving. Or like a coordination between them, like they're working together. And you could go a little faster if you wanted. You could try that. Now you can go a little slower and see how it's different, how it feels different. I notice that my chin is lifting up and down a little bit. So I, I, I didn't do that on purpose. It just sort of started to follow. So you could try that if you wanted. I mean, we get all kinds of, you know, these little movements. You might even start to get a little movement of the hands forward and back. So you could make those movements a little bit bigger. We just started with the fingers and the toes, and now we've got the wrists and the ankles going and the elbows going a little bit, and even the chin. And then we're going to bring the hands down 
And let's lift the feet up and we'll circle the ankles. If you want, you can also add the wrists. Perhaps slowing them down, but see if you can keep them in sync again. So whenever we work together like this, trying to keep things in sync is a way to, um, well, develop those neural pathways. So we're doing something instead of doing four things together. So, so this is, we're doing two things together with just the ankles, and now we're doing four things together. And if we can link the hands and the feet together, we're doing two things together because these are a pair. And then if we could link all four of them together, we're really doing just one thing. So we begin to, uh, and, and this requires that, that feeling that, uh, and let's go the other way. So the feeling becomes one feeling with practice. Going from the more analytical side of the brain to the more, uh, say creative or um, intuitive side, right? Because we can't think about doing four things at once. I can't anyway, um, but I can do them if I'm sort of doing them together. I don't know. I mean, we have all kinds of things that we do, or even when we walk, we take walking for granted, but it's such a, uh, it's a very complex movement there's so many things that we do and of course if you look at if you have uh, if you have children or grand or grandchildren who are little babies it takes them a long time to learn to walk it takes a lot of practice they don't just get up and walk and let's see oh so we're going to do the uh we're going to do some leg lifting here some lifting so go ahead and lift up and then point and flex the foot. Point and flex the foot. So like this. And we're gonna change feet. Trying to keep the foot flat. Trying to let it turn in or out. It may do it anyway, but, and then try the other side again. Trying to keep it flat. And then switching. And then lowering back down. We're gonna do some leg lifting. So we lift up and we pull the toes back. So that is like sitting up tall in mountain pose with just one leg extended and then back down. And I, for this, if you have a little trouble, uh, sometimes we need a little extra support. We can put the hands on the edge of the chair like this to help lift up. So in, in yoga, we would call this, uh, with the legs extended, if we're seated on the floor, we'd call this staff pose or dandasana. And I cannot do this with uh, not using the back of the chair and lifting both legs forward. I can do it with the back of the chair so it takes practice. We start with one leg because once we move one leg, we need support to hold it up. We need support to keep the spine extended. So when we remove that leg, notice how there's a tendency to slump a little bit. So lift the leg and at the same time, extend the spine. And if you don't lift the leg as high, that's okay. Think about extending the spine as you lift the leg up so that I'm, I'm lift, I'm not losing the lift in the heart and the, and the thoracic spine. So if I'm sideways, I'm like this. And it's a lot easier, or I should say it's uh, easier to keep the spine lifted. If we're using the back of the chair, if this is really easy, you could slide forward and not use the back of the chair and think about lifting the spine up. So keeping that lift at the same time. And if you're, if you're uncertain about the lift part, bring the feet back down for a moment, lift up, see what that feels like, and then try extending the leg again. 
and keeping the lift. So we got to keep the lift here as we extend. You could also try pressing the foot down into the floor as you lift the spine and extend the leg. And that gives a little bit more support for the lift. And let's come back down with the legs. That's a great exercise to do if you're um, <clears throat> if you have to sit for a long time. Just some extensions like this can sometimes stretch. It gives a nice stretch for the backs of the legs here, for the uh, calves and the uh, hamstrings, which tend to shorten when we sit. So it's a nice, uh, and you can feel the thighs contracting here. The quadriceps are uh, firmly, they're shortening, they're contracting as I lift my feet. And then come forward in the chair, please. And we'll circle around. Nice wide stance here. Feeling the movement underneath you, the weight, or the weight shifting underneath you. So bring your attention down through the sitting bones and the feet and follow the weight moving. It kind of moves when you lean over the foot, it moves into the more into the foot. And then as you lean back, it goes to one sitting bone, then to the other. So it's going in like a circle underneath you. You may, you'll feel the other areas as well, but you'll feel the weight more in one area. Almost like you had a, uh, if you've ever seen like a, I'm trying to think of what like a, uh, if you put like a lid on the floor, if you, uh, sometimes a lid will fall on the floor and it kind of doesn't spin around, but it kind of goes like this until it finally slows down, 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 then stops on the floor. And let's just go the other way. So it's kind of like that. So there's this movement around and just one or the emphasis is on one part, even though the other parts are also touching. And then sitting up nice and tall. And let's stand up. So we're going to stand up in mountain pose. I'm going to do a few, um, <clears throat> we'll call them semi-chair poses. Because I don't like to overdo you know, chair pose is almost as if you're sitting down in a chair like this. But I don't like to overdo it because for a lot of people, it's hard on their knees. But we're, the way we're going to do it, you shouldn't have any pain in the knees or discomfort in the knees. If you do, you're going down too far and you, make the, you need to make the movement smaller. So standing first in mountain pose or seated in mountain pose. and extending the spine up. So we're lifting, rolling the shoulders back, keeping the belly, keeping some engagement here in the abdomen and a firmness in the buttocks, firmness in the buttocks. So it's almost like the buttocks are moving together a little bit. And there's a firmness here as I extend the spine up. So this is my mountain pose. And then I'm gonna soften my knees slightly, making sure that they're going straight ahead softening the knees so that if you were to look down at your knees, they would be starting to move towards your toes. They're not going out to the side and they're not going in. Remember the knees, a hinge joint. It really only goes like it only goes forward and back. So we never want to go. The knees don't want to go past the toes. So once you've covered the end of your toes, that's as far as we're going to go. We're going to come back up. You could also use a block here or a rolled up towel and give it a gentle squeeze, just a firmness in the inner thighs here. And that also helps to support the, uh, the pelvic area and the lower back. So there's a firmness, firmness, firmness between the legs, firmness here, extension of the spine up. You could even put your hands out like this if you wanted. So we're gonna go back and forth like that. And you might need to adjust how far apart the feet are for the block. 
You could also turn, if you have a block, you could turn the block too. This is too wide for me, but some people may have wider hips. And if you're seated, if you're standing, take a rest for a moment and then try a few more <clears throat> of our semi-chair poses. If you're seated, go ahead and slide forward in the chair. Slide forward in the chair and then walk the feet slightly back and come forward so the weight begins to becomes forward over the feet more and then press the feet down and then sit back up. So I come forward, press the feet and come back up. So I'm leaning. And again, you could use a block here too. You could use a block. Sometimes there's a tendency for the knees to splay out adjusting the feet too. So we start to bring the weight over the feet. And then we're gonna gently turn from side to side. So a little wider stance here is often more comfortable. And if you are standing, just be careful not to whack your, uh, your hands on any furniture. Actually, even if you're seated, you could have the same issue. So as you start to become a little freer and you're turning easily, make sure there's nothing in the way. And then sitting up, standing up nice and tall. And we're going to um, do just a little balance before we sit down, sit down and do Shavasana. So coming back to mountain pose, I'm going to go ahead and lift up. So this is our crane pose. We're going to start to lift up our foot. So it's just a little off the floor. And if you need a chair, if balance is an issue at all, Please have a chair handy. Turn sideways so you can see this. You can also do this seated, this lifting up, keeping the spine extended. So there's a grounding in the foot and then an extension up as I balance on one foot. If balancing is, uh, is problematic, try resting the ball of the foot or the toes like this on the floor and that'll give a little more stability or you can add the fingers on the back of the chair. And then go ahead and come back down. We'll do the other side. We're very gently lifting the foot up, feeling the engagement in the leg. And then coming back down. And we're going to sit back down. So to do our Shavasana, we'll get as comfortable as we can in our chair, relaxing the shoulders. And breathing. And we'll continue on for a few minutes and feel free to continue on past that after we complete the class. Well, if you're watching on cable, you, we may lose you at 1130, but feel free to settle into Shavasana and breathe. And then just stay with it for another five or 10 minutes. Using each breath as a chance to relax and release, especially the exhalation. In the inhalation, we can add a little bit of lifting of the heart, just a tiny bit. We'll be focusing on the exhalation here, feeling ourselves grounded, feeling our sitting bones grounded, feeling our feet grounded, and just breathing naturally. So a nice natural breath in and out.
continue on for about another minute and then we'll end the formal part of the class and you can continue with your Shavasana on your own. Namaste. Have a great rest of your day. And if you have a few minutes, please continue with your Shavasana a little bit longer until you feel like it's enough.